Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through various RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one I'm going to be doing three uh, OSR adventures. They are very different from each other, they're each for different systems actually, but they're all old school and they're all easily applicable to basically any kind of um, any kind of system. And these are all three, as I said, very different kinds of adventures. This first one, The Tomb of the Twice-Crowned King and Other Adventures by G. Hawkins is actually more of a region with a, a bunch of different adventures within it. This is the biggest document, it's about 44 pages, and it has a lot of really cool adventures in here. Um, the first one, the Tomb of the Twice Crowned King, is the biggest and it's the most um, well-developed, I would say, but they're all pretty good. And uh, it's, it's a quite interesting adventure. I, I recommend at least checking it out here. Now, as you can see, it says these adventures are for six to eight PCs of levels one through 10. So these adventures really are, I mean, it's a whole thing, it's a whole campaign. And uh, it's assumed to be part of a Gunderholfen campaign, like this is sort of a Gunderholfen, that Banga dungeon, is in this overworld map. It's mapped onto that. Um, so it, it sort of assumes that you're going to be um, playing that. You don't have to, obviously, and it makes that clear. Um, now, the main map of the main dungeon is by Hawkins. But then the other adventures, once you get past the Tomb of the Twice-Crowned King, the other uh, maps are all by Dyson Logos. So um, just keep that in mind. I mean, some people really, really like Dyson's maps. Some people, you know, just don't like the fact that they're kind of see them used a lot. And, and the maps that are chosen for this are some that I've seen elsewhere in other adventure products before. So if you've used them with other parties or if you've used them on your own, then you wouldn't really want to use them again, right? Now, this game is, is written for Osric, right? Um, we'll see that the next one is written for Swords and Wizardry, and then the third one is Shadow Dark. So keep that in mind as well. Now the layout and the, the font and stuff is the same layout and font for DCC. And again, some people really like that, some people don't like that so much. A great piece of art here of one of the creatures that you can encounter in one of the dungeons. So here's an uh, introduction and the level range included. Now the, the, the kind of the highlight of this adventure, which is the Tomb of the Twice-Crowned King, is for levels 8 through 10. So, I mean, really there's only one adventure for a low level, it's the Grottoes Under Brigand Knoll. So if, and, and you're probably not gonna level up to level three by the time you get to that one. And even if you do, you're probably not going to get to five or so, which is what you're gonna be, need to be to get to a lot of the other adventures here. So either you put this into a region and you fill it with more adventures, all of these into different regions, or you take them as separate adventures when you want them and, and put them into your campaign. Um, because again, like the level range, it doesn't have a neat, like you do this one first, and then you do that one first, and then you do the next one first. Like really, that's not how this works. But there's a cool adventure site, level range and adventure synopsis rundown right at the beginning, which is good. And then you get the map. And it assumes, again, it says, if you're playing Gunderhalfen, um, then you have all of these things here. Um, so you can just add it right in. You don't have to do that. Now, one problem is that the, the font has been cut off here at the bottom. But it's not a big problem, but just keep that in mind. Uh, you can still read it, just a little hard. Um, so you can add this into one of those campaigns. But even if you didn't, it's a great little hex crawl you could do. Um, you could use this as your hex crawl and all that. Um, now the town, by the way, Longfelt, is not detailed here. Halithvorn and the villages uh, of Hrugpith and Drunpool, very particular names, will be covered in the f in forthcoming products. Perhaps they have, I'm not sure, but they're not in this book. Here's another piece of art. This is the twice crowned king itself, themself, I'm not sure. I guess it's one creature, because it's a king, not kings. But it's the sort of the big bad of the tomb that you're going into. And now here's the tomb itself, the full version. You can get the partial version online, but this is the full version. Um, great isometric map gives you an indication of, of where you're going and what, what's in each region. There's a little bit of confusion in a couple of the rooms about spacing and, and, and distances and things, but it really it wasn't bad at all, and I think that it's really well laid out. It's one of its strengths. Um, it's a pretty standard dungeon there. It's really hard. It's levels 8 through 10, so you're looking at a high-level dungeon here. Um, there's a little bit of you know choice when it comes about how you approach things. Where do you go first? Where do you go second? You can move things around a little bit there, but it's pretty linear. Um, in terms of, okay, you're first going to start in this area, then you're going to go to that area, unless you're very lucky in finding secret doors, and then you're going to go to that area. Kind of go through it that way. Um, Heimfell is the, is the twice-crowned king, and he basically forced his family to be buried alive with him, or to be buried undead with him, and so you're, the things that you're fighting are his 
crazy dead family or his wives or his not wives exactly, <laughs> the, the women that scorned him in life. That's kind of a recurring theme in this dungeon. Some of them are still alive. Some of them are quote unquote still alive. <laughs> um, you get some cool uh, wandering monster um, rules here. And uh, some of them are really interesting, I think. But as you go forward, it's laid out precisely. If you guys know DCC, it's laid out precisely like the DCC rooms. Um, you know, just kind of texts. But the but the setting, or the I should say, the presentation is really good. You get bullet points, you get bolding, you get italics. Um, the different locations are bolded as well, where things lead to. So it's 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 well laid out. Again, it's one of those things where if you're going to print this out and play it, you'd want to have the map separate. Otherwise, you can just have a separate document open. I think that works. One of the interesting um, elements of this is the nymph, or the uh, yeah the the sylph. I'm not sure you put it. There's this uh, one of the um, the nymphs is still alive, and uh, you can have her join you. And then there's this succubus that's also in here that wants to uh, destroy you. Um, both are trapped, and you can kind of free them both. But uh, one will help you, one will hinder you. And it's very classic in which one's to be trusted and which one isn't. The voluptuous, you know, beautiful one. They're both beautiful, but the one that's very clearly... I mean, very clearly, players playing D&D &D will know. Oh, yeah, this is probably a, a succubus or something like that. Think, yep, you're right. Here's the king's concubines. And then the servants of the king. Um, and uh, you proceed through. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that it's a two-level dungeon. And the numbering restarts when you get to the lower level. So, And it's not exactly clear that it's the second level of the same dungeon. In fact, it took me, maybe I'm just slow, I'm probably slow. But it took me a little bit to figure out that it was the same dungeon. Just because, I mean, I'm, I missed the portal that leads you down here. And it doesn't look like the entrance to this place is a portal, but it is. You find a portal up in the upper tomb and you warp down to section one. You also can fall down here by going over the waterfall, which was uh, in the first map too. So there's two technical ways down here. You could just jump down the waterfall and get down here right away. Um, but once again, same sort of idea. You get vampires, undead, uh, cool traps, cool tricks, lots of treasure, lots of magic, and some um, very powerful things you're dealing with. I mean, again, it's level eight through 10. So I think a lot of people are never gonna play this because it levels eight through 10, but it's a cool dungeon. And so if you ever, do get to levels 8 through 10 or around there in your game of choice, or you want to play a one-shot adventure, high-level one-shot for old-school games, which would be kind of interesting, you can run this. And it's a good, solid dungeon crawl. Um, all the way down to the very end. Now it's quite big, all said and done. You know, you're talking about 31 rooms. Let me look back. 31 rooms in the second floor um, and 24 in the first floor. So you're looking at 55 rooms all said and done for this dungeon. That's a pretty big dungeon. It's going to take you several sessions, many sessions, to get through this. Assuming you just go straight through it and you don't leave and come back. Which I would imagine you'll probably leave and come back. Great homage, at least it seems like, to the original. Or not the original D&D cover, but the one with the big, you know, thing with the eyes. And the, the adventurers are prying out. And then you get the series of other adventures coming on from this. Shrine of the Witching Stone. This is also for levels 8 to 10. And it, this is a Dyson Logos map, and you can see it's much smaller. Dyson's maps, he does mega dungeons, obviously, but he does a lot of smaller dungeons, too. And these are mostly smaller dungeons. It's an interesting dungeon. It certainly is. I like it. There's a pseudo-dragon, um, which is... It's good to have dragons. Here's another adventure, the Tower of Thard. Now it just kind of jumps right into it. Once again, you have the background to it and the hooks to it. Um, and then notes about it, monster stats going through, and then the uh, actual tower itself. And now this one does have maps broken up on pages, which is really cool. These are interesting dungeons. They're just really high level, and I think it's... There's a lot of low-level dungeons out there, a lot of low-level adventures out there. There aren't that many, in my experience, that many high-level dungeons, and so it's good to have them. The White Seers of Netherite, which is for level 6 through 10. That's quite a long, large range. This one's a much smaller dungeon, right? You can see it's only 10 rooms, really. But it's more like areas and zones, and there's this sort of, you know, these psionicists who are here you got to deal with, and uh, there's rules for their psionic powers and how that works. The Black Shaft of Narbonius, the Accursed. This is a great one. I really always like these dungeons that have multiple levels or like a, a central connecting hub with, with multiple levels building off of them. Um, the Savages of Cragstone Peak, which is for levels 5 through 6. Kind of like Neanderthals here, 
once you're even dealing with sub-chiefs. So it, it's going to fit into a very specific kind of campaign. Not every game has Neanderthals hanging out in mountains, right? We've got Wyverns, though, Pteranodonts, right? Uh, so this is, like, very specific in its tone. This is, like, old school. You could actually take this and run this for, like, a Stone Age RPG. I think that'd be really cool. I've never actually played in a Stone Age RPG before. Uh, I think that would be fun to do. Lady of the Flame. This is a really good one. I really like this adventure. And it goes back to that first um, image, the, the sort of humanoid figure in the fire. That comes from this adventure. The Lamassus and Gross Maggots. <laughs> a pool of law. And uh, if she's released, there is an ear-piercing scream of joy, and she moves to deceive, torment, attack the party. And she flees at five hit points or less to spread chaos and destruction. The Ice Witch of Jagged Peak. Here's another really interesting one where you have these um, chasms that go down and lots of different ways of approaching it. There's lots of different entrances to this particular adventure, side entrances, which is really cool. Again, I like any adventure where there are multiple ways of approaching it. Tarkesa, the Ice Witch, and the Rod of Winter, a very powerful magic item here. A really powerful magic item here. And then the Grottoes under Brigand Knoll, which is the levels 1 through 3 adventure, which is a pretty cool one. There's essentially this uh, hill top with hobgoblins and uh, brigands running things. Oh, this is Sabretooth Tiger here, just, you know, just because, he has you do. And then down below there are these grottoes where you have these fey and ancient magic creatures down there. So they found it, and now there's sort of a, you know, what do we do about that <laughs> down below? So you're probably going to fight your way through the brigands, and then you're going to fight your way down, or the players are going to fight them down into the Seder Grotto down below. There's a fey arch, an earthy tunnel, and lots of different interesting fey things going on down here. Giant flowers and plants with lilac blossoms and yellow flowers, succulent orchids. They all do different things if you if you inhale them or if you, you know, move past them. There's a leprechaun. <laughs> and then there's Gorath, who's a satyr. And then there's the water sanctuary, which is really interesting. There's this uh, kind of diagram over here on the right of how it works and how it looks. And there's this golden goat inside, or rather the golden ram. And you're trying to, of course, maybe get him. Um, but if, it, if Ramos awakens an overwhelming desire to possess an evil and chaotic neutral NPC is viewing him, who will likely attempt to steal him. So if you're evil, he will draw you know, greedy people to violence to take him. So if you don't get rid of him right away, it's going to be a source of further adventure, which I think is kind of cool. And if your party has some chaotic neutral characters or evil characters, then they're just going to try to turn on their party to take it. And that's it. That's the whole document. So really, a solid set of adventures. I think they're all really good. The first one, the Tomb of the Twice Crowned King, is, is the most detailed. It's the biggest, and it's the one that probably has had the most work put into it in terms of the actual author himself. The Dyson Logos maps, you know, you take them and you kind of fill them with, with stuff that you see fit. I highly recommend uh, G. Hawkins' Tomb of the Twice Crowned King and Other Adventures, especially if you have a higher level campaign or you plan to get there, or you want to do some high level one shots for old school games. All right, the second of these is much smaller. Uh, well, not much smaller, it's about 10 pages smaller. It's The Well of Frogs by uh, EMDT, uh, which is the first Hungarian D20 society. This is by Istvan Bulldog Bernard. I think that's how you say that name. Uh, it's a Swords and Wizardry Adventure module for levels 1 through 2. Now, what I like about this one is it's an urban adventure. You don't often get these. Uh, urban adventures, urban dungeon crawls even, are, are kind of left out. And, and I think one of the things that I tend to see when I see an urban dungeon crawl is that it's a total. It's totally accidental that it's in a city. Like It's like, oh yeah, and there's an ancient tomb beneath the city, right? Or you go into the sewers and you stay in the sewers and it's just like this sort of sewer loop. But this one makes good use of different entrances from different buildings and different reasons for the different street denizens to know about parts of the dungeon. It's a cool. It's only a 30-room dungeon, so it's not that big, but it's got um, a lot of great ideas, a couple of really funny ideas. Now, this is the same organization that puts put together Castles and Tillin, and you can definitely tell. You can absolutely tell. Um, so it's a, it's a city, and you have this Piazza de Rospi. De Rospi. This is the plaza where all of these um, adventures are taking place, and the plaza is a sort of, not, an, not a dungeon in and of itself, but it, the locations are, are detailed, the NPCs are detailed, the factions are detailed, and there's random encounters day and night there. And uh, they're interesting, and you could spend time in the plaza. Now, it's definitely Roman-themed, like old old Italian-themed, I should say, and there's like references to legions, and it's like, like the ancient ruins are Roman in their tone. 
But you could totally change all of that and put this in almost any city with a sewer system or with a you know an ancient city with ruins perhaps beneath. Um, and uh, I think it would be really cool to do so. The Well of Frogs. So the idea is that there's this crumbling quarter of the city and one of these dark alleys has a square, you know, a sort of a plaza in the you know, forgotten part of the city. And there's a well. Uh, if you go down the well, you get into the dungeon. But there's also other entrances there too. Um, and you get some references to what the city is like. Uh, Casidum, Casidum, the city of cities. Yeah, it's definitely probably Rome at one point. Something like that. There's the Liberator's Guild, the Barber's Guild, the Chandler's Guild. <laughs> now, one of the big bads of this dungeon, the big bad of this dungeon, sort of, is a guy named the Splinterer, and he is a were-rat, and he has four froglings that he's taken in that are named after Italian Renaissance painters, or artists, I should say, <laughs> right? Very clearly, uh, you know, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle reference is there. And um, you have to fight them, because they're kidnapping kids to eat them. So they're not good. But the, 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 the random encounters you get up in the plaza are really cool. And I could see this being, I could see this being the sort of thing that you put into your system or you put into your setting. Players have to come into this plaza a couple times maybe to meet some of the characters here to go into one of the buildings here. Um, and then as they go through a few times, they are, then maybe they see this well. And then at some point they realize, or there's a, a, a lead that takes them down and they find the dungeon. So it'd be kind of a cool place to not just like start off but to see it a little bit, and then to go down there. And then you get the description of the various places in the plaza. So you get the Well of Frogs itself, the hideout of the street urchins, the shrine of Cloacina. And here's the random encounter tables for the well. There's basically three things that are kind of like, well, I guess maybe four things that are kind of important about the well, uh, or about the dungeon down here. There is the Splinterer and his uh, minions, and all of his rat companions and things. That's one big... Uh, portion of it. There is the kind of hidden tomb of this old frog general who used to lead frogs into military combat. It's kind of a different, harder to uh, approach part of the dungeon. Then there is the um, the collector, which is sort of like the, I mean, it, it reminds me of something out of like, you know, Marvel, the collector of the Guardians of the Galaxy sort of thing. There's this lady who just has rare things, anything, people, art, you know, whatever it is, she wants it. Things of beauty and rarity. And so that would certainly be a reason to come down here. Uh, I'm sure that that could be played into lots of different campaigns, right? Where you have to go and see the collector because you have to find something that she has and trade with her for it. Or you have to, you know, you have something very rare, the only person will buy it is her or keep it safe or whatever it might be. It'd be kind of interesting. And so that's another thing down here. And then the fourth thing you get is the temple to the frog god which is hidden and difficult to get to approach. You get lots of long tunnels and halls. Um, now here's, oh, I, I kind of just jumped right past this, but this is the map. If you turn your head a little bit, um, you can see one of the things I really like about this is that there are lots of different ways down into the dungeon, lots of different ways of approach. There's the main well, which is I, but you can also come down into the waiting room of the collectors from E, or you can use, you can find the secret place in J and go down into 20. Or you can, if you somehow manage to get down the grate in the temple at sea, you can go all the way down to 15, so or all the way down past that to 30. So there are different ways into the dungeon. Um, if you have a party of all halflings, for example, you can just fit right through the grate at sea, or you can pry it up and, and get down the pipe there. Here is a, yeah, Donatello, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raffaello are the four frog boys, frogmen, who were raised, uh, they are just as bloodthirsty and love human meat. You gotta defeat them. Uh, then there's the Temple of Sothogus. Sothogus, yeah, which is the frog god. And it's kind of cool. There's a big lake down here, and you have to cross the bridges, and uh, there are lots and lots of frogs, and 66 frogs, and a giant bullfrog that will keep coming every round until you either defeat them all or you get out. So if you do take what the, uh, if you take the giant emeralds in the eyes of the statue, you will be very quickly devoured by frogs, or you're going to have to fight a lot of frogs. <laughs> All right, well, I think the the Well of Frogs is a really cool adventure. I would love to put this into an urban campaign. I could even see this being in the same sort of urban campaign as the uh, that Shadow Dark Funnel that I referenced in another adventure, or in one of these reviews. I mean, the one where you're in the, the Vault of the Slime Lords. I think that would be kind of cool to combine with this one, or have, you know, be separate, but in the same city. You could build up kind of a, a, a well or a wealth, 
a, a horde of urban adventures and then unleash them on your players for a, a city campaign, which I think is sort of an underplayed kind of campaign. Uh, the last of these adventures that I want to cover is the Forgotten Halls of Brass Fire, which is a first to third level adventure designed for use with Shadow Dark RPG. Now, this is a really cool adventure. I think there's a lot of good things about it. I wanted to draw attention to a couple uh, aspects that I thought were really, really good. Um, great overview. It's a 26-room dungeon. It's pretty straightforward. Um, the dungeon itself is not... I mean, it's good. It's totally solid. It's totally fine. It's got faction play, which I like. It's got uh, some cool creatures here, in, in particular the Chul, who is a cool kind of roaming villain you can run into, kind of the big bad, uh, if you don't count the faction leaders and that sort of thing. Um, but there's a couple things that I really like about this. Uh, the rumor table, table is good. The entrances, there's multiple entrances into this place with good descriptions about the different features of the place, that the burrows, the brass doors, what the ruins, caverns, or ravine are like. There's a combat overview. Now, I think um, Kelsey over at the Arcane Library in the development of the Shadow Dark RPG and in all of the sort of official adventures for Shadow Dark includes this combat overview. Well, what happens when the people retreat? What will they do if overwhelmed? You know, And so it's sort of become a, a standard form for people who are creating Shadow Dark adventures. They'll include these you know, combat overviews. I think that's good. I would have liked... I think probably what I would prefer is a list of the major NPCs who run each faction and their desires and interests. I think if you're going to do one or the other, that's more important. But if you're doing just a dungeon crawl combat heavy thing, it makes sense to know who's going to retreat to where and how they do that and when. And that's good. This has a few narrative hooks with some notes about what the, uh, you know, where that hook is solved or how that hook is solved, which is really good. Too often, I think hooks are given to you and there's no, you have to piece together how it would be solved, given to you right here. And then, and this is what I wanted to highlight, there is an amazing action hook in Medias Res. So you have, here's what happens in. You know, here's some hooks to if you want to fit this into a campaign. And here's if you want to run this as a one-shot or the beginning of a campaign. Boom. You start off in the action. That's awesome. I think a lot of adventures give you one or the other. I like that this gives you both. So that's what I wanted to highlight here. Really cool idea, and I wish more people did that. I'd like to see it in more adventures. And it, you know, An option for an in-medias res adventure. You start off right here. And here's the ravine and random encounters for the ravine areas, which is areas 4 through 8. Um, or in areas 4 through 8, you have this danger level, I should say. Now, one thing, and I, I, I don't know, I don't know how this works exactly, but if you look at the random encounter table, there is a 1 result, right? But the random encounter table is rolled with a 2d6. So I, you can't roll a 1. And you see this over and over. This is the only way to encounter the tool. So unless there's a rule in Shadow Dark that I missed for how to reduce random encounters, or there's a rule in here that I missed, which I don't think I did, for under what circumstances you roll a one on this, you just can't encounter the tool. So I think that's a mistake. I think what he meant was two, and then three through four, five through seven, eight through 11, and 12. <laughs> I think that's what he meant. So that's what I would do. Uh, but you can't roll a one on 2d6, sorry. Anyway, just keep that in mind if you're running this adventure. So there's uh, a reservoir. There's some good magic items here. There's some good uh, uh, stuff here. You know, once again, you have to wait till the end to get the map. It's just, you know, kind of standard. But if you're going to open this up, there is a player map that's included with the file. So you can at least get that. It's not numbered, but it has the overview of the whole. And you can um, just, you know, open up a separate file and have the map open as you're reading through it if you're playing online. Um, there's a, a little bit of, you know, puzzle work going on here, but there's simple puzzles. Um, you run right away, if you take one of the paths, you run into the Sahagin and uh, their leader. Now, um, there's one chance, one chance to basically um, negotiate with her. And it's, it's, it's more likely that you will, because they retreat through the pool and hide if they attack. They're tired after fighting off some of their enemies from the other faction. You see the other faction dead around them. It's, it's clear that they are in a conflict with the other side and that they are not interested in fighting you. So you could push it and attack them, but you don't have to. And you are given an opportunity to negotiate. I like that a lot better than it assumes you'll fight. And if the players kind of go over and above to try to negotiate, then they can. Rather, you start off with the negotiation as the option. And then if they want to fight, 
they can, they can push it. And they have, you know, if they don't, if they fail, if they return empty handed without doing what they need to do, then they just become an enemy. Once again, you have 2d6 with number one as the chul, right? <laughs> it just doesn't seem possible to me. You basically have the two factions of the Sahagin and the sort of like zombie devolved dwarves that are cannibalistic, the Crag Baron, as they're called. And then there's some NPCs there that you, again, you could kind of interact with them. But these are cannibalistic, devolved, crazy dwarves. It seems more likely that you're going to be siding with the Sahagin over these guys. The Sahagin are, yes, granted, they're, they, they also eat people. Maybe, maybe you just go and destroy them all. <laughs> My players would probably just destroy them all. The Halls of Devotion, the Halls of Atonement, Halls of Absolution, the Kytherian Mechanism. Uh, it's missing some Kytherian cogs. And once functional, activating the mechanism allows offered to undo one event of their choosing from history. So this place is hugely important, but you have to uh, gather the uh, seven missing Kytherian cogs. But then they are scattered to far-flung places. That's actually kind of cool, so you could make this right a... Um, yeah, and the curses that changes to history are twisted, brutally transforming the recipient. So this was definitely like a continue past this adventure adventure if you happen to do this, right? We'd have to undo that and become a whole big quest to undo the, the changes to history. Or maybe a villain could be trying to do this. And in fact, I think that's probably what I would do to make this a bit more interesting is that someone else has gathered these cogs and is coming here to do this and you know about it and are trying to stop them or something like that. That would be kind of cool. A bunch of NPCs, thugs, Sahagan, and Craig Baron generators with some magic items and some random potions. And some of these magic items are pretty cool. Now here's the map, and I, I really quickly want to highlight a couple things about it. I really, really like how things are just written right on the map. You know where all the monsters are. Boom, right there. They're laid out. Not all of them, the Chul isn't mentioned. The Chul tends to patrol one particular area. Not mentioned on here. But otherwise, you get most of the creatures. You get good descriptions of where the traps are, the secret doors are, and all that. You also get in and out, so where you're able to enter into the dungeon, all the possible entrances. That's really cool too. Now, if you look at the actual blades laid out though, you basically, you can choose right or left. And there's a couple, there's one real link through room 23. And then otherwise it's just this side of the dungeon, that side of the dungeon in the middle. But leaving that aside, it's a solid dungeon. I really like it. And I think those, those, there are certain um, twists to it. Certain things that were, not twists, I shouldn't say, but like certain features of this that I really like, like that narrative hook idea, the different entrances there. Um, and the, uh, just the overall way that the map is presented. I think those are all great, great ideas. So here are three very different, <laughs> very different adventures. I hope they are interesting to you. I'll put links below to where you can get them. Um, and I will see you guys in another video.